I think we're ready to go ahead and get started. Yeah? I'm trying to pull everybody up here, put it in gallery view for this group so we can see everybody in the room. Aloha, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our program today, the East West Center Gallery Sunday Spotlight. Today is the Spotlight on Hawaii Contemporary. Why does Hawaii need a triennial? And we're going to be featuring and having a, a talk with the Hawaii Contemporary Executive Director, Catherine Don. So welcome, Catherine, for joining us today. Thank you for joining us today. Looking forward to this conversation. Um, as we're still, uh, the East West Center Gallery continues to be closed to the public um, given the current uh, pandemic. But we are still continuing to offer uh, programming in conjunction with our current exhibition. So I want to welcome you on behalf of our team. I'm Annie Reynolds, the East West Center Gallery Curator, together here with East West Center Arts Program uh, Coordinator Eric Tang and East West Center Arts Program Assistant Navahine Lanzalati. So thank you all. Um, as we're closed to the public, uh, we bring you these, uh, these programs that are in conjunction with our exhibition that's called Beyond the Surface, and we're featuring permanent collection works um, that were gifted directly from the artists. Um, this exhibition really developed and came out of this current time as we're looking at our own collection, looking back at what our program has done, um, and really considering how we're going to be going forward as well kind of digging into, into our own past um, that preceded us. Um, we have actually installed the exhibition with the hopes that we will, uh, in the coming months, be able to open the gallery to the public. Um, at the current time, we're still closed. Um, but we, we do have, we can offer a, a photo gallery that actually takes you through the exhibition. It shows how the exhibition is installed how the pieces work together and tell that story together. But at the same time, it also has really nice photographs of each piece individually that you can um, experience. It's not the same as actually coming to an exhibition and being in the space, um, but it's what we're able to offer at this current time. So with this in mind, uh, we want to also use uh, this platform to be able to open up the conversation with other organizations that are also um, thriving and striving and going through and pushing through um, and continuing their work through the pandemic. Um, and so we really wanted to have a conversation with Catherine Don. Catherine, Catherine has uh, become the executive director during the pandemic. Is that right? You started in October, is that correct? In 2020. And so she and I are uh, kindred spirits in that way, as I became the curator during the pandemic as well. So we neither one of us know our current work um, pre-pandemic. Um, so we kind of share that in common and all of the wonderful uh, uh, opportunities for creativity there are, as well as all of the challenges. So in that kind of same idea, we want to talk about the Hawaii con contemporary, um, talk about its past, where, where you are and what you're doing and what your visions are uh, going forward as well. So wonderful to have you here, Kat. Um, thank you for joining us from Los Angeles today. So let's begin. Can we begin by talking about uh, the origins of the organization? Um, because it is now newly the Hawaii Contemporary. So can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you, uh, Annie, Eric, Nawahine, for inviting me to be part of this conversation and inviting Hawaii Contemporary to be a peer in just this community, wonderful community of um, uh, organizations supporting the arts and creativity in Hawaii. Um, and you call me Kat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, where, uh, yes, Annie, it's really funny that just to acknowledge the fact that we're both new to this in the middle of pandemic. And I have to acknowledge that I haven't seen an art show in person for over a year, <laughs> which seems so counterintuitive to my life's work, which is dedicated to contemporary art. So just it's, yeah, um, surreal actually. Um, oh, with the exception of visiting the, the downtown art center and, and seeing the East West Center briefly um, <laughs> in, in December. But um, maybe I'll start with acknowledging the fact that I am sitting in Los Angeles. 
um, but I'm the director of a Hawaii-based organization, and it's this is also due to the pandemic. <laughs> um, so the silver lining of COVID is that remote work um, is making it possible for people to connect all over. Um, I'm originally from Maui and um, have spent my entire professional career in contemporary art in Asia, actually. I'm a specialist of contemporary Asian art and I've worked with for-profit and nonprofit organizations. Um, but in the beginning of 2020, um, I moved um, from Hong Kong to Los Angeles and um, with my family, um, went from one COVID situation to another. Um, and, uh, I've been actually a board member of the Honolulu Biennial Foundation since the beginning, since before 2017. And um, when the previous director stepped down in the middle of the pandemic, I stepped in to, to help. And it's been, I have to say, COVID's been um, a real uh, blessing for the organization to actually give a moment of pause as the organization transitioned from a biennial to a triennial format, meaning an exhibition every three years rather than every two. And we did this, we had to change the name <laughs> um, and allowed us to become Hawaii contemporary and to broaden our uh, scope, not just based in Honolulu, but to all islands and to have um, a umbrella platform that allowed us to think about our Triennial as our signature um, event, but also to allow other activities that happen in the off years when we're not having the triennial exhibition. So um, yeah, that, that's a brief background um, for where we are. So then um, you had two previous art biennials here in, Hon in Honolulu and mm -hmm that time it was still in Honolulu only. So 2017, 2019. Um, can you talk a little bit about the origins, sort of the mission and some of the goals and kind of creating a biennial that's based locally here in, in Hawaii? Yeah, absolutely. So speaking on behalf of the founders, um, which include uh, uh, Dr. KJ Bayasa, Isabella Hughes, it actually began with an exhibition called um, Chain of Fire that started in 2014. And I think that's when um, there was this swirl of conversations following the close of the Contemporary Museum. Um, in, I believe it was 2010. I think it was, it was very much due to the financial crisis and situation. Um, but with the close of the Contemporary Museum in Hawaii's only dedicated institution to contemporary art, um, the biennial emerged out of these conversations of wanting to contribute to the landscape and continue the dialogues and discussions amongst um, other cultural partners and museums that um, present contemporary art, but maybe not exclusively as part of its mission. And so that was the impetus for um, bringing the biennial together. And also, um, you know, really a core to its mission is to be able to present um, local uh, contemporary Hawaii-based artists as well alongside uh, global international um, artists that share the same conversations um, in contemporary art that are happening um, in regions surrounding the Pacific Ocean. So our mission is to connect Hawaii and the Pacific through contemporary art. Incredible. Yeah, it's amazing to see those those dialogues that are happening that are on the local and on the international level. Um, mm -hmm. the same conversations that are that are happening. Um, to take a step back for a moment, can you talk to us about um, kind of the the network of the art biennial beyond Hawaii and sort of what what that is for for folks who aren't part of kind of the contemporary art scene. Oh, sure. Yeah. So a biennial, I know this is very much art speak, <laughs> um, is an exhibition um, that happens every two years. And, um, and I apologize, I should know, actually know the specific dates for the origins of this. But, you know, the, the, the idea of a festival, an arts exhibition, um, uh, and its ability to bring together voices on a global level um, usually is attributed to um, Havana Biennial, which I believe, 
first started in the 80s. But actually, my colleague pointed out to me that um, historians like to note that actually the first global um, biennial exhibition happened in Iran and in the 70s. And for over 12 years, they were doing um, this kind of multi-site exhibition, inviting artists from all over the world who were really representative of different countries and current conversations. Um, and it, the important part about it is it's not commercial. So it's not propelled by um, other market incentives and it truly is representing um, current conversations on a, on a global level. And so um, what Hawaii Biennial, sorry, the Honolulu Biennial represented at the time was to be able to bring Hawaii um, into that uh, geographic conversation and just to be a place, a starting point for um, looking at a, a global conversation around contemporary art. So nowadays, um, uh, and actually due to the pandemic, there has been an alliance formed between all the North American biennial and triennial organizations. And there are approximately 25 listed. Um, and that due to the pandemic, we've all come together to try to figure out what the future is of these kind of festivals, because it's really, you know, what are we doing now that we're not actually meeting in person and how do we um, you know, re pivot um, what, what this event means? Sorry, was that your question? <laughs> you, you shared some really wonderful images um, with yeah. me from the earlier, the previous biennial. So just for as sure. a reference for people and if you wouldn't mind kind of reflecting on the images, I think that would be really lovely to hear your thoughts on past biennials, just yeah. to kind of into the present here. So. I know, definitely. What is talking about art without actually seeing it, right? <laughs> and it's just not the same seeing it on screen, but it's better yeah. than nothing. Here we go. Yeah. Oh, actually, Annie, do you mind just going back to that, the first slide? Absolutely. Just, you had asked about, um, you know, we changed our name to Hawaii Contemporary, and I wanted to point out for the audience, we, um, when you change your name, you also get to think of your logo. <laughs> And I wanted to point out that this, um, if anyone's wondering what the, this is, this is a geometric pattern designed by a former biennial artist, um, Ara Lelo, um, a pattern based on the La Hala Niho Niho weave. And we, um, since the pandemic gave us a lot of time to reflect on, on what our past, present and future would be, we thought about this idea of bringing people together and thinking about Hawaii Contemporary's role as a connector and how that the metaphor of weaving hala um, really manifest the values that we wanted to share as an organization, these ideas of kinship, about connectivity and just bringing something together. And um, yeah, just being a connector. So that's what that is if anyone's wondering. <laughs> oh, wonderful, thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm gonna go on to the next yeah. slide. Um, yeah, so this is Choi Jung Hwa. So the first biennial was in 2017. Um, while the, I mentioned that the Chain of Fire exhibition was in 2014 and that was um, uh, hosted in, in Luxury Row. Um, the first biennial opened it uh, nine different sites across Honolulu with 33 different artists, both from Hawaii and globally. And Choi Jung Hwa um, is a very, is a world renowned um, Korean artist who's probably most well known for these sort of inflatable works. And what you can't see here is that this flower, this lotus flower is actually moving. It's meant to be breathing. And it was um, selected by the artistic director Fumio Nanjo who at the time was the, um, the curator of the Mori Art Museum. And he's a legendary um, arts curator in the Asia contemporary art scene. And um, this, the, for those who are familiar with Asian culture, the lotus represents this rebirth, um, th this new beginning. Um, the idea that this beautiful flower emerges out of the muck of, um, you know, of, of a pond. And um, this was the symbol of the first biennial of just being this blossoming of contemporary art in the islands. That's beautiful. Um, but also really fun. Who doesn't yeah. like inflatable things that move around? <laughs> <laughs> um, and this was really fun too. This was um, Yayoi Kusama. Um, Yayoi Kusama is one of the, probably um, the most highly sought after and recognized female artist um, today. 
in the contemporary art world. And um, in fact, putting on my auction hat, since I used to work for an auction house, she is the most expensive um, female contemporary artist. Um, as a side note, she, women artists still do not sell for as high as male artists do. So, but you know, if anyone's gonna do it, it's gonna be her. <laughs> Anyway, this was um, a, a very fun and interactive exhibition that was installed at the, um, the Howard Hughes building. And it was this fully immersive room of, of dots. And this refers to her practice of, um, of these meditative, extremely painstaking meditations on, um, I guess you'd call on mental health. I mean, it's it looks very simple, but her work is extremely personal and very poignant and connected to her own personal um, struggles with um, uh, mental health and, and, you know, is a form of meditation. Anyway. Um, and, oh yeah, this is just, this was the hub. Um, hopefully people remembered this. Um, but we were very lucky at that time to work with the, um, or be sponsored by the Howard Hughes Corporation um, that helped catalyze the, the magic of the, uh, the 2017 biennial. And in this pavilion, which was called The Hub, um, we had over a dozen different artists exhibited um, uh, on site. And then there were um, eight other exhibitions at different partner institutions like Shangri-La and the Honolulu Museum of Art. But, um, you're looking at an image by Echo Nogroho. Um, and um, I, oh, I, didn't, I don't think I would put the image in here, but I love his work because it said, um, you know, all we need is tolerance. And I think that this is really um, just one of the things that we love about contemporary art that, uh, you know, artists are sharing a social message. And this is very much at the core of what the biennials are trying to do. It's not trying to be a display of art for art's sake. Um, you know, art just as an object or something to decorate your wall. And again, we, we do have to emphasize to people that this is not a commercial exhibition. Um, we're, we're, we're bringing together these artists to show their works, not with the intention to sell them, but really to share a message. And um, his works uh, are, Ekunogoroho particularly is well known um, in uh, the contemporary Asian context for using this graffiti-like um, style, um, which is, he's usually doing murals and, and um, graffiti-like work, but with just very strong social messaging. So, um, yeah. yeah it's really <laughs> exciting to see art come up in such a, such a uh, beautiful way in, spaces that aren't aren't usually uh, featuring art so so prominently so I just remember mm -hmm. uh, just seeing the front of this of this building um, again it just was such an exciting time yeah and then um, indoors oh yeah inside oh yeah so you can kind of see a little bit of um, echoes um, mural and then the works that we're looking at are by uh, Marcus Marzan um, and these were just beautiful installation. Um, and, and, and you know, it was re it's really important that when the curators are working on this, and I'd mentioned that um, Fumio Nanjo was the artistic director, but he worked very closely um, under the direction of Nahiraka Mason, um, the first biennial's curator. And it's really interesting to think about curating exhibitions in this way with people that may not know each other, but then and then have two very disparate skill sets or areas of expertise. And our organization is kind of, I guess, forcing the conversation and collaboration, but in a really beautiful way where these, these kind of connections may not necessarily happen otherwise. And in the art world, things get to be um, are very often labeled with like very simplistic terms like countries, like here's Chinese art or Indonesian art or something, or um, by medium and say like here's paintings or sculptures. And what the biennial is trying to do is not adhere to some of those labels and to focus just more on, on the thematic um, pressing conversations in contemporary art. Um, by the way, I do see Eric's comment in the chat. If anyone has questions, please just like jump in. <laughs> um, 
Um, oh, and this was Team Lab. This was uh, the Japanese um, uh, collective that um, most people around the world know their work for just these super fun um, interactive digital art displays where, you know, what they do is like they're capturing your movement and then it's being projected up on the walls or um, in this particular image was these projections of flora and fauna moving around on the ground and kids were invited to, or kids of all ages, <laughs> were invited to draw their own interpretations and they were then scanned and then reprojected. So it was this beautiful um, in interaction, but um, you know, when, I think this was uh, probably one of the most memorable because it was just so um, accessible for people, but um, I just learned from our current curator Miwako Tezuka, um, who's the curator for the current uh, upcoming Hawaii Triennial, and her specialty is Japanese contemporary art. Um, she spoke about Team Lab's origins is, you know, not so much of a like a gimmicky <laughs> uh, um, a creative collective group. I mean, they are now some of the most successful artists um, in Japan working today, but the idea came from wanting to really expand on Japanese tradition and the idea of, from Japanese painting actually, birds, flowers, um, landscapes, these very iconic um, things and, and how to resonate with the next generation of, of an art audience. And this was, Team Lab was their response. Um, and Anyway, they're always thinking as a group, they're always thinking about how to take art beyond the museum walls. So literally they're doing that. Um, yeah, this is the um, in the entrance to 2019, um, the the hub. And this is a work um, installation by Corey Tom, um, who proudly, he just was awarded the Joan Mitchell Award at the end of last year. And that's like a hugely prestigious art award in the art world. <laughs> um, uh, similar to like the MacArthur grant, which is considered like the genius award, the Joan Mitchell award is a very prestigious grant. So it's just really wonderful to see um, uh, Hawaiian artists being recognized on an international level. So um, yeah, we take pride in that. And we always, you know, we have such a small community. So we always want to celebrate everyone's um, contributions, even if it's not related to just like the biennial in 2019. And um, this was a work by Leland Mayano um, at the Foster Botanical Gardens. Um, this was this huge <laughs> result of community collaboration of um, gathering invasive species, um, not from Foster Botanical, but another botanical garden and bringing volunteers together to help Leland weave together um, a canoe. Uh, boat and it had the, this was just this was the recipient of the golden hibiscus award that was launched by the foundation um, to you know recognize a singular contribution to um, the contemporary art conversation and um, I, I just love this image because it's it kind of I just think the creation of it also represents a lot of what Hawaii contemporary aspires to do which is really bring people together in the creation of work and it's not just about like the destination, it's very much about the journey as well. So, you know, um, there was over 70 volunteers and I believe it was from the HMSA um, uh, volunteer group that helped him put it together. And I think the next image is also, it's Bernice, right? Akamine and yeah, her Kue um, Kalo project and yeah. Um, this was also a work of um, volunteers. So what you're seeing, <laughs> Annie, we were talking about this. I wanted more pictures with people in it, um, but these are just the install shots. Um, this is the, uh, this was the end product of this procession that actually Bernice um, started in Washington, DC, where she created all of the, these Kahlo plants. And the Kahlo plants are, um, uh, the the, the anti-annexation petitions that um, she's crafted into a Kahlo plant. And she traveled this work from DC and the end point was um, here at Eliolai Hale. And again, I think over 150 volunteers walked with her from Ilani Palace to the Hale. And it was this, um, the, it was a performative work. So this is the end of the performance piece.
So I'm not going too much into the art. <laughs> it's just fun to revisit this. It's really wonderful to, to reflect back on the two previous biennials and, mm -hmm. and Space. And I love hearing uh, about the community engagement in the in the installation process too. So really, um, getting the community involved in there. Uh, let's see what's going on. Yeah, um, yeah. And this was also Bernice's work that appeared at different sites um, around Honolulu. And um, I, I, sorry, I don't remember the name of the work, but it was a um, addressing houselessness that exists in Hawaii and um, that the ideas, um, just bringing up all these very pressing ideas about place, about sovereignty, about land rights. And, um, you know, I think this is the way that art has the power to catalyze conversations. And I think very much when right now we're working with the next Hawaii Triennial curatorial team and we're working through different artist proposals where, you know, the conversations are all literally about how is this artwork creating conversation or contributing to a narrative that's, um, uh, that's important both to the artist, but also to the people it represents and the, you know, how is it gonna be read um, in, in context? So, um, and yeah, this is just another, um, uh, I'm just looking at this and like, this is the work of a massive installation effort <laughs> um, by the artist Chiaru Shiota, um, who um, internationally recognized. And I guess I should mention that, you know, some people may not be familiar with all the artists that are usually exhibited in the biennial and that's, that's okay. Um, but it is like, just, we're so proud to be able to bring together artists that in their own respective contexts, like, um, you know, from Japan or from, from East Asia or Southeast Asia, that they're all like the leading voices of their communities. So even if, um, you know, that's sort of the lens in which um, artists or projects are, are selected, that they, you know, they're representative of these conversations happening all over the world. Um, and yeah, this this that Chiara Shota's work was the was first exhibited at the Venice Biennale. And for anyone who hasn't heard about the Venice Biennale, that's like the Olympics, the main the main event <laughs> for the art world um, that happens every two years. Thank you. Um, oh, so I think this is a series of images. Um, I think you were um, one of your questions was about. Uh, who our partners are or where we're exhibiting. Yes. Um, so we're really proud that in uh, 2022, for the first time, Hawaii Contemporary um, will be partnering with Ilani Palace and as one of our venues for, for the contemporary multi-site contemporary art exhibition. And um, it just, yeah, it, these are just a, a handful of images. Sorry, this is pixelated. Um, but uh, we'll be working with Bishop Museum and um, Foster Botanical Gardens, again, the city and county. Um, we are exploring some other sites with the city and county, including some abandoned bunkers. Um, and one of the ideas that the curators are um, sharing, and this was explored in our recent art summit, is um, you know this idea of the chance encounter and the unexpected. So. Um, kind of like that feeling that people had when they saw Team Lab um, for the first time in 2017. That you know, oh wow, this is contemporary art and it's immersive. Um, that same uh, approach is what the curators are thinking about when they're trying to build the next triennial. And um, we also work in the Honolulu Museum of Art, and I believe the next one is Shangri La as well. Oh, Hawaii State Art Museum. And um, yeah, and Shangri-La. And these are just um, our currently confirmed partners. Um, we are working with a few other sites and lots of planning <laughs> that's getting done between now and next spring. Great, wonderful. It's so nice to hear about kind of where the organization has been. I'm curious um, about your audience. If you're reflecting back into the audience from the, the 2017 and 2019, um, if you can speak a little bit 
in terms of who was your intended audience and reflecting back um, who was your actual audience and then kind of how do you um, envision an audience that is international and in the contemporary art world, but then also can uh, simultaneously cater to the local arts community as well as to the local uh, general public as well. Mm -hmm. For that, um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, it, you know, the 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 sort of easy off the cuff answer is we're trying to attract everyone. <laughs> that <laughs> art is for everyone. Um, but, you know, we acknowledge that that truth that, you know, we are, we're a very young organization. And, um, it, you know, I can just speak in broad brushstrokes, I wasn't as intimately involved in the first two iterations. But, um, you know, in 2017, the total stats for visitors was nearly it was 97,000 um, viewers over a period of um, over a period of eight weeks, eight to nine weeks, and that was at all the different venues. And 20% of those um, visitors were from out of state. And in the next iteration, um, the organization was able to increase um, the out of state or non local visitors um, to 40%. So 60, and, and also increased the total number of viewers to over 100,000. Um, and that's, I mean, just for any festival or arts event, I mean, that's just a huge um, number of um, eyeballs <laughs> for people in enjoying contemporary art. And I know that for the second iteration, um, there was, you know, more education programming and more focus on Keiki. And um, there was over 6,000 students that were actually um, part of uh, docent led education tours to the hub. And this was, you know, a concerted effort by the organization to, to articulate to ourselves that really we are, um, we're focusing on, on the next generation on, you know, younger people. And the purpose is, you know, we all care about our kids <laughs> and the next generation in the future. But, um, you know, I think that there's, uh, we're also subscribing to a philosophy about, um, you know, if we don't cultivate an interest in arts early on, it's something that may not be as natural or um, intuitive later on in life. And um, I mean, speaking from my own personal experience, I'm really lucky that my family, um, like, it, you know, embraces creativity and I got dragged around to museums and um, arty things a lot as a kid. I can tell you, I didn't really understand any of it, but it um, it did create a, a formal interest of mine to um, somehow be involved in art. Um, I, yeah, I know I, I also, I did do studio art in, um, in university and very quickly figured out that I should not be doing a studio <laughs> art, but I like to be involved in art. I, I majored in art history and East Asian studies. So um, can we turn to talking a little bit about the current work that you're doing during the pandemic? Because uh, it seems like the organization is really kind of, it, besides being in the pandemic, was already within uh, kind of a transformational period in itself going from the biennial to the triennial and mm -hmm. that kind of coincide with the pandemic you kind of get to be a biennial and a triennial with your <laughs> current summit work you got to kind of hit that hub with the two-year mark um, and still right. be um, visible and have great programming but then mm -hmm. it also helps you kind of transition and and um, pivot forward to the triennial in 2022 that you're building up to so can you yeah. talk a little bit about the summit and your um, recent work that you guys sure. have been doing? Um, yeah, so the art summit, and actually just following on your earlier question about audience, you know, I think what we, um, uh, so before the pandemic, we'd actually already planned to have an art summit because we knew that um, we needed something um, in lieu of having the biennial in 2021. So we were thinking in a very traditional way of like, we're gonna have an in-person discussion with our curators and some of the artists about what the triennial would be. And as we all shifted into um, COVID mode and virtual crash courses, <laughs> Zoom, um, we, we, we just um, 
you know, went full on for a virtual um, dialogue and conversation. And coming out of it um, after, you know, it was a four day program and we just um, uh, had the videos live in the month of February, our audience, it, it's, it's amazing. Um, we had nearly 3000 registrants from over 67 countries. And for, we had 16 different um, uh, videos, um, conversations that happened that um, on average, I, had to, I just had to look up these stats because we're preparing them, but we had over 60,000 unique views of these videos collectively. And like, we would never, what, in the numbers I'd shared before, 100,000 over a period of 11 weeks, mm -hmm. we would never have gotten that much um, uh, uh, you know, direct attention. I mean, so we just, uh, it really exceeded our expectations. Um, and to be honest, I was told that we were lucky if we would got 500 people just to like sign up and pay attention. So to get where we have, I mean, we're just so grateful to all of our partners and um, everyone that we worked with to help us get the word out, including the East West Center. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. Um, Incredible. And yeah, so I mean, what that really was a big learning curve for us and a positive one because um, even right now, just coming out of it, it's catalyzed all these wonderful conversations even before we've opened the triennial. And I think it's been really also helpful for our curators and artists um, to just get the, I don't know, the brain waves going <laughs> about it. But you know, for us, actually the biggest thing was no one's been able to travel. And when you're planning a in-person exhibition, usually you bring everyone over, you do a lot of site research. Um, no one's been able to do that. And we've been doing our best with, with Zoom and virtual visits, but like we all know it, nothing replaces in-person. And so the summit was also a way for us to try to communicate who we are, what is Hawaii. Um, in the summit, we had all of our partners present, our presenting venues, like present themselves and talk a little bit about the history of the organization and to use video to just show people what we're talking about. So um, we did, we all put on a little bit of a like video editor, content producer hats to try to um, share that with everyone. And, and it, it doesn't replace, you know, in-person visits, but it did, um, it is helping um, you know, get the, the conversations going. Yeah, that's incredible. I, I'm just curious, um, how do the artists and the curators work together? Um, I'm just sort of curious of what that, that process is um, and how those conversations take place, if it were in person and how it's having to kind of be adapted in terms of, uh, in terms of the current uh, time. Yeah, well, I mean, you, no one's traveling and we're, you know, um, uh, so the curators are working together under this um, thematic umbrella of Pacific Century. And through that vision, each curator is working with a subset of artists and they're discussing thematically um, the projects and the, the physical constraints of, well, physical and budgetary constraints <laughs> of, of what their projects will be. So, I mean, it's just a lot of emails, Zooms, phone calls. Um, we, I mean, to get technical about it, I mean, we're, we're struggling to just make sure we get as much iPhone video and photos and diagrams of all these venues and conversations up on our Google Drive <laughs> to share with people. Um, it's, I have to say, it's been really, really tough. It's yeah. been, it, it, you know, just not having that you know, all those, those conversations that happen offline, like in, in waiting, it's like the water cooler conversations are not happening. There's only so much you can do in sort of like a one hour Zoom meeting and, you know, we're, we're doing our best, but, um, you know, thank goodness for Zoom if we didn't have that. <laughs> no, no, imagine a pandemic that happened 20 years ago. We wouldn't have <laughs> the same place at all. Uh, may I share some of the images from the summit that you shared oh. with Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. It's just nice to pull those up for a moment. There we go. Oh, yeah, so um, these were a handful of our keynotes and speakers. So we, our curatorial director is Melissa Chu. She's the current director um, of the Smithsonian Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, D.C. Um, 
She is also a specialist and curator of contemporary Asian, specifically Chinese art, and was the first, let's see, at, she, when she was appointed a role at Asian Society in New York, she was the first female curator of contemporary Asian art. Um, she brought on a team with Miwako Tezuka, um, who's also based in New York, and Drew Broderick, who's based in Honolulu. And um, through them, they helped um, uh, curate the, the summit program, um, which meant inviting a number of um, key speakers and voices um, that we are all, the, it, the whole conversation meant to be the precursor to the triennial. So we had Ai Weiwei, we had the Esther Gates, um, we had the scholar Homi Baba, who during the summit, he talked about, um, he and Melissa talked about actually the origins of this idea of Pacific century and this term um, that, uh, you know, in the 20th century, it was, uh, people have referred to it as the American century and how the 21st century might be a Pacific century. So. I know that term itself is highly charged with a lot of political debate. And that's great because the whole point of art and the summit is just catalyze these conversations. So very much we welcome, <laughs> at least I do, um, you know, the, the dialogue. And um, here we have pictured Kapulani Langraf, Jamaica Osorio, Gay Chan from Edium Public. And um, for anyone watching, if you didn't catch the summit, um, it's not currently available on our website, but you can just email me. We're, we're happy to um, share these videos. And we're currently working with a number of um, potential education partners to you know, continue the, the, the presentation of, of, the, of the content. So anyone from any education institutions, feel free to reach out. <laughs> and yeah, I think the other images were just some of the other voices um, that were in the summit, which I will note like what we did as the structure. And this was, you know, we're very grateful to some of the conversations we had with, with you and with Eric before, because we were trying to just figure out how to do this, not having done a virtual conversation before. But what we did is that each day um, had a live Zoom session after the keynote session. So in the live session, rather than just immediately opening up to questions, um, my colleague Sarah Raza led a, um, uh, an experts panel. Uh, we called them like live digests with other experts from the arts community talking about what they just heard with the keynotes. And that um, was, was really um, engaging and successful and, um, and I'm just, this is a good visual reminder of what we were doing, <laughs> but you also noticed there were, um, some younger non-art world people who were involved in, in the summit. Um, for example, on our last day, Ohana day, we, um, because the themes of the triennial, um, circulate around, um, environmental awareness, social equity, land rights, we invited young youth activists, Kavika Pegram from um, Hawaii Climate Youth Strike and Nakia Tapalo from who started Black Lives Hawaii to have a conversation with um, Professor Mari Matsuda and Jamaica Osorio talking about activism and change and you know, using art as a launching point, but just talking about how that's supposed to be a catalyst for for talking about like just pressing ideas and 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 motivating people to participate in, in a conversation that's actually going to help um, our community. So that was the um, conversation that happened on the last day. Anyway, um, yeah, it was really fun. We also had a cooking show on Ohana Day, that, so that's why Gooch is there. <laughs> um, and then um, I wanted to ask you, so uh, now you're going into this triennial um, uh, mode instead of the biennial. And I think I would imagine that gives you a little bit more breathing room to have three years between, <laughs> yeah, a little more breathing room. But I'm wondering by opening up to that triennial instead of the biennial, what does that make room for? And how do you kind of see, um, what are you gonna be doing in the years between to kind of be working on the ground and kind of, uh, uh, kind of continuing to be visible in the years between the triennial? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And it's something that the organization, um, we're, we're just starting to address that. 
Um, in the early days, I mean, since we started with uh, Chain of Far as a, as a visual arts exhibition, um, that was um, the foundation's answer to doing something the off years, just have a smaller visual arts exhibition. Um, I think right now for Hawaii Contemporary and looking for it and thinking about, first of all, we're still not out of a pandemic, so we can't really organize another in-person exhibition, but we're finding that, um, I mean, we've articulated to ourselves that we think our value add to the community can be more focused on educational programming and um, building a connectivity between the community in the off years. Um, when I joined uh, in the middle of last year, I spent a lot of time like just talking to all our partners, trying to get to know some of the past artists and just understanding the biennial from their perspective. And one of the, the most um, common responses for, you know, why does Hawaii need a biennial or why, does, why do we have to exist was um, about having a sense of community, bringing some of these artists together. Like if with um, some of these artists, especially on other islands, talked about just how important it was for them to be able to meet other working artists that they would not necessarily come up uh, upon because maybe they're just not invited to the same exhibitions or they're just not in the same circles. And, you know, I. I think that's really important about having opportunities to just get together. With Zoom, it's actually, you know, it's a, the opportunities to get together are happening all the time. Like we can just be on Zoom all the time. But that too is really important. Um, we were talking earlier about um, the professional development workshops that we started and that East West Center is now kindly, you know, also doing round two of that. And, um, that was one of our responses to how do we, first of all, as an organization, keep in touch with our artists um, and creatives, um, but also how do we give back, do something. Um, in the beginning, when the COVID first hit, we were just like trying to look up different grants and financial resources and make sure artists knew about them because there was a lot of support happening on a federal level um, that was trying to ensure that the creative community could weather the, the storm. And so we approached it that way. We developed this professional development series that was led by my colleague, Sarah Raza. And we, it was a six week program where we invited specialists. We worked with the Hawaii Arts Alliance and Pu'uhonua Society to, um, oh, and the whole program was kindly supported by the Taiji and Noako Family Foundation. Um, so that we offered a free six week course for artists to um, have these professional development workshops with people specializing in fundraising in um, uh, digital media and marketing and all these skills that people, you know, just in the creative industry should have. Um, and like coming out of that, I think the response is really positive that when they got to meet each other, like again, a way to connect and create this cohort, but also to have a safe space to ask very personal questions about like, what do I do with my arts career? Should I get a master's or should I, you know, carry on or how do I do grant writing? It was really important, I think, to hear like where certain people are in their careers and, and for us to have a chance to share our knowledge. Um, it, Cause it's also different for me, me and my colleague, Sarah, we, um, have developed our professional careers outside of Hawaii. And so we're also trying to help be a bridge where we can um, if people are trying to reach um, uh, platforms and organizations, you know, internationally. Great, great, wonderful. Well, Kat, I have one final <laughs> question or we can open it up um, to more questions from uh, people who are in the audience here. But I wanted to ask you really, what's your vision kind of going forward uh, with the organization? Um, well, that's a big question. <laughs> Where are you like? <laughs> you know, I just, I, I hope that everything that we do um, resonates with the idea of being a connector um, and just going back to our simple mission of trying to connect Hawaii and the Pacific. And to us being a connector, it, it means collaboration and um, being the fact that like we are not a brick and mortar facility. Um, we are not, uh, you know, we're something a little bit, our, our, our ad, uh, how do you say, it? our strength is mm -hmm. 
um, content and conversations with artists and using that to um, be what connects us to a lot of different organizations that are not specifically just the arts, but also go beyond that. Um, you know, during the summit, we developed this Umeke art initiative and we um, made a focus effort on reaching out to partners that are not specifically arts or organizations like the Apollo Project or Sustainable Coastlines. And these are people that we work with anyway, naturally when we're developing arts projects. And to your earlier question about how do artists and curators work together, um, everyone is different. Um, but what's been really fun is that sometimes there's artist projects that are like, you know, they want to do a fashion show, but made out of upcycled materials. And so we have to be thinking about reaching out to fashion houses and brands, but also working with community um, uh, like environmental awareness organizations and all the different people. So I, I just hope that we, yeah, can truly be seen as, as a connector and creating these co meaningful conversations. Wonderful. Well, thank you for joining us today, Kat. Really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're very busy already getting ready for 2022. I can only imagine. <laughs> but I Thank open you. it up to the floor. I think we have, um, with who we have here in the room, uh, I think we can open it up. And if anybody wants to uh, turn your microphone on, unmute yourself and go ahead and ask a question directly to Kat. Or if there were any questions in the chat, if you're, if you're not as, uh, if you're feeling shy, you may also just put a question in the chat and I'd be happy to read it too. I have a question. Thanks, Eric. Get things started. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, Hawaii Contemporary has any plans, hopes, dreams to have a physical space uh, in, in Hawaii um, just to make it easier to host a triennial or if the plan is to um, innovate with, um, you know, creatively with partners as it's done. I just have to say that it's uh, been hugely impressed by um, the biennial effort, now the triennial effort. Um, and I think it's just been brilliant so far and really great for the creative community, for artists, for the community at large in many ways. Um, and, and the Art Summit in the virtual space has um, uh, also kind of um, demonstrated that great level of engagement as well. But yeah, just wondering about the uh, physical space, if there are any kind of hopes for that. Yeah, well, and thank you, Eric, for your comments. Um, the short answer is no. <laughs> um, there is so much just physical and logistical overhead, financial overhead that comes with managing a physical space that we see are, um, that it's better for us to focus our attention and energy in working with our partners um, who are able to carve out that time um, when we're hosting the triennial to um, work with them in their space. Um, we're an extremely small team currently, like two and a half people. <laughs> um, and we, <laughs> we, we do build out the teams with like an amazing crew of volunteers and other um, contractors, but um, it's, you know, I, I think our efforts are best focused on programming and, um, you know, creating the the roadmap for then implementing in other spaces and we don't have the um we're you know we are a nonprofit and we do not have an endowment um and so we don't have the financial resources to dedicate to a physical space but i i see it i see the upside to that which is there are a lot of wonderful spaces in hawaii not just in honolulu but in other islands as well, that we hope to realize the triennial on different islands in the future. You know, spoiler alert, it's not happening right now for 2022. Um, we're going to focus just in Honolulu again, but in, you know, part of our name change was to have that ambition um, to be on other islands. And, um, and, and yeah, and I think I, I love, you know, Melissa Miwako and Drew's vision to create the unexpected in, in different places. So, you know, we'll, we'll be a little bit flexible for, you know, new and unusual, taking over new and unusual spaces for the arts. Great, great. I think we have time for just one last question. If anybody had a question. I have a question. Hi, Michael. 
Hi. So how do you, how, hi. thank you so much for your talk. And of course, we've all appreciated the great work of, of the previous biennial and look forward to the triennial. But how do you see uh, your collaboration with the East West Center going forward? Positively, <laughs> collaboratively. <laughs> um, yeah, I hope that uh, right now, and you know, honestly, we, we've talked about um, uh, different spaces. Um, we have, I see the organization as having different ways of collaborating with other partners, not just in terms of access to space, um, but in terms of education programming or outreach. Um, or even doing research, um, you know, in a non, uh, when we can all travel again, I think what's so important for artists who are participating that are not from the island, it's really important for them to have, be able to learn about Hawaii and um, what the conversations are through our partners, not through us. I think actually just, you know, the earlier question about how are we planning virtually, it, we're kind of becoming the bottleneck a little bit with these conversations with artists because you know, there's only so much that we, they, we can share from our experience. It'd be so much more helpful if they could get information from a lot of different people and to kind of create a more holistic um, understanding of the islands and conversations. So I hope that, I mean, right now, um, I love that we're having this conversation now with the East West Center and um, they've been hugely important in our community outreach for the summit. Um, and reaching out to audiences that we don't currently have. Again, you know, that's, uh, I'll, full disclosure, you know, we're such a young organization. We don't have the audience that we aim to be reaching out to. We have a pretty small mailing list um, and we're trying to grow that. But, um, you know, we, we do acknowledge we need, we need our partners and we want to reciprocate as well. So um, I don't know if you have ideas, let me know. <laughs> Yeah, and it's interesting too that, I mean, in very different ways, our two organizations have have to somehow uh, work on an international level and at a local level at the same time. And how we do that, I think it's great that we can support each other and have those conversations going forward because I think we're um, both in a really unique situation in that way. Yeah, yeah. No, I look forward to more conversations. And, you know, recently, um, uh, just I forgot who I was speaking to, but you know, it's sometimes it's also not fair just to think of our audience as like local and international, like in the islands and outside the islands. I think that there's still for us a lot of work that we can do just in Hawaii itself. <laughs> so first of all, like on other islands or beyond the arts community, arts and culture community. Um, um, when we do think about our audience, I, I think that a measure of success is, is if people can come to see the exhibition and say, wow, I've, I'm not an art person. I've never been inside the museum before, but to be interested enough to come and pay attention to me, that's really like, that's who I, we want our audience to be, um, to somehow be inspired and not, you know, just preaching to the choir. Although, you know, we do rely on that core constituents, but. Of course. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for taking the time today. We don't, do we have one more question possibly? Thank you. Thank you, oh, Lantana, for welcome. being the most dedicated audience member out there. Nice to see you here, sweetie. <laughs> but thank you so much, Kat. Um, really happy to talk to you and have this conversation with you today and looking forward to continuing working with you and seeing the great work that you are all doing in your organization. Um, just really an exciting, exciting time. So thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon and we will be having more conversations and more programs in conjunction with the current exhibition and we'll be sharing more info information with you soon. So thank you for staying with us this afternoon. Aloha. Thank Bye, you. Mama.